Greetings, family. Greetings. You know, this is your brother, Archbishop Belmont, from the Noble House of Belmont. And, um, you know, today, like every day, we <laughs> it's always a beautiful day, man. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut straight to the chase with this one. You know, I had this book for a very long time. Um, I'm going to say probably now almost about a year. So I don't know why I said very long time. Maybe a month, times, or minutes, whatever. All right, but the book is called The Belmont Belmonte Family, a record of 400 years by Richard J.H. Uh, Gothill. Now, and it was published 1917. Now, this is way before I came, or my physical body came into existence, you know. And uh, as you see, this is my family, my lineage. And it says a record of 400 years. So this information <clears throat> is going right before you know, um, right before the fall, and I mean the fall, I mean the fall of 1491, 1492. So, there's going to be some pretty good information here, and everything is not going to be, in my opinion, right and exact, because, yeah. excuse me, there are infiltrators, imposters who came into the family, and, um, you know, only one who's been speaking this, this information today is me. I'm the only one who has the surname who's really been bringing the family history um, from the past, present, and future to the forefront. Because he who has no roots cannot stand. I repeat, he or she who has no roots cannot stand. This has nothing to do with DNA, uh, even though DNA could help, but not really this all have to deal with genealogy and genealogy is the origin of where you or your family come so like i said i can only speak for my family and then where my family come from i.e the people they come from the nation the empire and you know the beautiful part about this is i get to go from my own personal lineal perspective because many brothers and sisters get to teach in history, but they never come from their own lineal perspective, i.e. their family. Tell me who your family are. Were well, they important people? Because it seems like it's always someone who's not putting their family lineal origins to the forefront, i.e. a pedigree. Until today, here on the King's Bench, which King Clifford Jefferson has shown, uh, where we also have our brother, Murphy, uh, Bishop Murphy from the House of Murphy, um, then our other brothers, Brother Burgess and Brother Simpson from their respective houses. And then, um, and they're doing a great work because they're going to be following suit regarding um, how I'm presenting mine on this, uh, on this platform. And I'm just recording, you know, on my own phone. So, you know, this is not something that's going to be, um, you know, super elaborate regarding you know graphics it's just going to be straight info and um the beautiful part about this is you can read along with me and we're going to go through a few pages because this stuff can get lengthy but you know the parts i'm going to highlight are the most important so once again pay attention um <clears throat> and follow follow along because what i'm doing you should be able to do too and once again, this is not to hurt anybody. This is here to clear up the confusion. I'm coming to claim all that is mine. And I repeat, everything that my ancestors had and those who had died um, interstate without a will, I'm claiming everything that they did. Labor, blood, sweat, and tears. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. And we're going to go straight to page... I'm going to go straight to page 120. Excuse me, sorry. 119. All right, chapter 9 says, Stray members of the Amsterdam family in Holland, France, England, etc. All right, so it says, The present record would be quite incomplete did it not include a, free other, a few other members of this widely scattered family. 
So they're telling you my family's large and they were, they were scattered, who evidently belonged to one or the other of its branches, but whose connection is quite impossible to establish with the means at present available. So what they're speaking about is books because the books are the only thing at the moment that they were able to use or the uh, uh, archives to try to piece our history. But now with the age of um, technology, computers, I'm able to bring the rest together, okay? It says, in the first place mention must be made of one in Amsterdam itself, a Moses, son of Joseph Belmont. In the various lists mentioned above and made up from archives of the Amsterdam community, two Joseph Belmonts are mentioned. One died in 1673, the other in 1687. It is probable that the first of these two is the Joseph son of Jacob Belmont. I, since the wife of the second, a said, I mean, excuse me, is said to have been named uh, Leah, while the wife of Jacob's son was Sarah Vaz Oliveira. We came across this Moses in 1684, 1688, 1724, and 1726. In the first of these years, he composed a small volume of Hebrew poems, the unique manuscript of which is in a Montezino's library at Amsterdam. Uh, the 32-month volume is, I think that's, the 32, I think that's, I don't know, the 32-month, the 32-something volume is fully punctuated and bears the title, Example, the book entitled Mountain of Godliness, composed by Moses, son of the Honorable Moses of Belmont. May God preserve him forever. In Amsterdam in the year 5444, which is the Jewish calendar year, which equates to the 1684 Gregorian calendar. In the second of these years, 5448, or um, Jewish calendar year 1688, Gregorian calendar, he composed inscription for the gravestone of Moses Gideon Obudiente. A copy of this inscription is to be found in the Montezino's library. The third date is given us in the Jewish calendar published by him in the year 1724 and running until 1940. All right, so um, just to paraphrase or go over this real quick. Um, this is really to show that I know at this point that the Belmonts over here, we were already probably in bondage. The darker you were, the more highly trans you were in bondage. And not saying every last one of these uh, individuals weren't dark because I'm quite sure some were, but um, and then my family, as you can see, some were Jewish, some were, you know, practice. We practice many different beliefs, you know, and that's the reason why, like, how they're telling you from the beginning, we're scattered. You know, some family practiced this, some family did this, family, you know, fought against each other, but that doesn't mean you aren't still those people. Let's continue. All right, so it says, uh, the title, Calendario Abraico Deste El Año, 5485, Barste Erde, 5700, and it was attached uh, to the volume of daily prayers in a set of six coverings the whole ecclesiastical year. All right, don't want to get all the way into that. That's just Jewish information. Let's get to the good stuff. Okay, okay. All right, so paragraph where it says, Amsterdam was at the at that time a great center of various interests dutch trade carried dutch men to all parts of the globe in the search for new avenues of commerce so the dutch as you see they were doing business uh dutch ships carried dutch settlers in quest of new lands to cultivate the arrival of the maranos and jews so you know the maranos are those uh are those moors who are now being converted over to uh uh to uh those Jews, excuse me, those Jews who have now been converted over to uh, to, to Christianity. Because you have, they had the Moriscos. The Moriscos was those Moors who got converted over to Christianity. And the Maranos was those Jews who got converted over to Christianity. All right. Now, the Maranos and the Jews are still one and the same. These are still, these are Berbers. I repeat, the Maranos and the Jews, these people at this time... These are Berbers, okay? Because Moors are Berbers. I repeat, these are Berbers. Let's continue. All right, so it says, The arrival of the Maranos and Jews in Holland coincided with the period of the great colonial expansion, 
when the little country around the Schilt and the Amstel put out its feelers into so many corners of the less known outside world. It was the greater Holland that sustained the mother country and provided homes for the surplus population before the time when the Dutch learned how to wrest land from the ocean by means of their famous dikes. After them came the Anglo-Saxon and it reaped the fruits of Dutch, French, Spanish, Portuguese enterprise, carrying it to its proper fruition. Now, what they're saying here is because the Anglo-Saxons themselves were actually the, the true title owners, i.e. the true land possessors of so-called America. Because the so-called Anglo-Saxons um, are Berbers. These Anglo-Saxons are Berbers. These are the original heirs. These are, the, If you want to go according to the Bible, these are the bloodline that have been able to trace back to Noah and uh, Noah and Adam. And now, not only that, but they're the highest claim in the position, i.e. first in time, first in line. Everyone else are like the younger brothers who came afterwards. So, once again, we all need to understand that the Maranos, the Anglo-Saxons, all of these people, all these nationalities that have been spoken about right here, these are all Berbers. They're all Berbers. Let's continue. All right. So it says, it was natural that the descendants of the Moranos should take part in this work. In most of the lands into which the Dutch went, these Moranos found settled men of their own race and their original persuasion, which means it was the same people. Looked the same, complexion-wise. So that means these were dark-skinned people. Berbers. So they're letting you know that all of the lands that the so-called Dutch went to, and they took the so-called Moranos, which are still Berbers, all look just like the same people who came with them. Berbers. <laughs> I'm not writing this. They're writing this. And the beautiful thing is, it's written in the history speaking about my family. So it's showing you that me, Archbishop Belmont, who right now is telling you via what this book is corroborating that I am who I say I am. Now, just like Prophet Noble Joe Ali said, they were jealous of him because of his nobility. And I see today they're jealous of us because of our nobility because we're bringing it to the forefront and we're living in it and we're stepping into it to its full totality so that way we can save our people. But our people don't want to be saved. You know what? So like I say, each is his own. But let me continue because I don't want to get off track you know, and, and get the fumbling. All right, so it's like it says, in most of the lands into which the Dutch went, these Moranos found settled men of their own race and their original persuasion, not only in the large European centers of commerce, Hamburg, Antwerp, and London, and the North Livorno, Le Leghorn, Venice, and Constantinople in the south, but beyond the seas, on either side, in the old India, washed by the waters of the Pacific, in the North India, on the borders of the Atlantic, they found relatives and friends. Do you hear this? They're telling you that everybody that we, everywhere we went, we found people who looked like us that were not just relatives, but also friends. Vasco da Gama led the Portuguese sailors to the great countries of the Brahmins and the Buddhists. He had a Morano pilot to show him the way. And the Inquisition at Goa dealt with Jews as with uh, Jews as with as with defecting Catholics and Lutherans. Columbus sailed to the west, searching for a shorter route to the Indies. In vessels equipped by money supplied by such Moranos as Louis de Sante, uh, Santango or Santejo, and guided by an almanac written by the Jew Zacuto. It is a matter of credible report that he not only had a Jewish doctor on board one of his caravels, but also some Jewish sailors, and that it was one of these who was the first to spy the faint traces of land. In addition, it is a matter of exact knowledge that both the Spanish and Portuguese thrones used the fair lands in the New World, which had come to them through the magnificent work of their hardy seamen as settlements for their criminals and their moranos. Y'all hear this? Mm, mm, mm. Pay attention. In such manner, the earliest Jewish communities grew up in the West Indies and in Latin America. Let me repeat that. In such manner, the earliest Jewish communities grew up in West Indies 
in Latin America. So that's telling you here in the islands where I'm presently located, San Juan. This is where the so-called earliest Jewish communities grew up. Descendants of these early forced colonists exist up to this day. I'm speaking right now. I have myself called attention to an interesting stranded colony of Portuguese Jews in the far province of Amazonas in Brazil. The records of the Inquisition in Peru, Lima, and Mexico are the testimony at one and the same time to the power of the Roman church there and to the astounding steadfastness of the Moranos. In the Dutch settlements, both on the northern and the southern continents, no such harsh regime held good. The case of intolerant old Peter Stuvazant, a Stuvazant, my bad, of New Amsterdam, a forebearer in the spirit of the late Paul Kruger, who forbade the first shipment of Jews to land in the island, was happening in an extreme and isolated case. From time to time, colonies from the south came to lay the seed of future growth on the North American continent. You hear this? So they're telling you, like I said, a lot of the brothers and sisters from the islands had to come to North America, or i.e., I'm going to call it Albion. It's not North America, it's Albion, or the Albion um, continent. All right, thus the Moranos and Jews, and remember they're always going to say the Moranos and Jews together. Why? Because they're one and the same. They're the same people, just different practices, but they're Berbers. All right, let's continue. Thus the Moranos and Jews that follow in the wake of the Dutch settlers, oftentimes settlers themselves, found their own people already upon the ground and were not the utter strangers they might otherwise have been. You see, this is because we're trying to show you, like we've always been telling you, that the empire extended on both sides of the Atlantic or both sides of the world. Y'all see this? And I'm glad that I can be able to show you this through my family and through the history that someone thanked the most highs have been able to keep track of the record of because this is imperative for us in this day and time today, especially when everyone knows that the, the third temple uh, is supposed to be built um, via for the so-called Jews. The, the messianic age they're showing you that i archbishop belmont as well we already showed you through king clifford jefferson via his family surname which they said jefferson had the h chromosome that linked himself to jewish blood we already tell you that we so-called got kicked out in 1290 via the expulsion of the jews and our uh, our ancestor edward the first had to make sure that we was able to keep our property um, and not allowed to get stuck into um, um, to anything uh, in fee simple, but Intel, we'd be able to still get our stuff. So, and they knew a day and time is going to come when we was going to find and re really remember. But um, I don't want to go too far into that because, you know, you can get lost if you haven't been paying attention. But if you pay attention to what has been shown now, you will see that as I'm explaining, because as my family is showing you that we're not only the so-called descendants of the Moranos, the descendants of the Jews, the descendants of the Anglo-Saxons. We're all these people. <laughs> we're all these people, but the ones who have the highest claim today is going to be the ones who came in first, which was the Anglo-Saxon Berbers over here in the so-called America, because this part of America is called the, uh, it's called Albion. It's the Albion Empire. And just like we read up there, it said everywhere we stepped, everybody looked just like us. And they were family. All right, so let's continue. All right, so it says, um, in the Dutch settlements, both on the northern and southern continents, all right, read that, excuse me. Uh, all right. Thus, the Moranos and Jews, they followed in the wake of Dutch settlers. Oftentimes, settlers themselves found their own people already upon the ground and were not the other stranger they might otherwise have been. It was in this way that a large colony went to Suriname on the northern coast of South America, and both Suriname and Potomaribo became colonists and farmers. So, as like they say, the way how they was able to come over here to this side of the Atlantic and do what they did was because the people who were on the boats, on those ships, looked like the same people who they came over to colonize. And now the ones who came over, like I said, remember, colony didn't originally mean to come and do slavery or indenture work. Colony really meant just like agriculture, you know, trying to make do some business. And that's what technically was before we start getting into all of this perverted shit that started coming around when we enslaving each other. And well, we ain't gonna get all into that. I want to go ahead and get to the most important part of this quick lecture, and it's about an ancestor named um, Baron de Beaumont. I'm trying to see which page it's gonna be on. Mm. 
give me a second. All right, first, let me go over here. All right, page 122. All right, so it says, second paragraph. It says, the island of Jamaica is said to have been the first land sighted by Columbus. At an early time in its history, it had a Marano and afterwards a Jewish population. Remember, these are all Berbers still. Marano can also be used as more, but more as we know are Berbers. All right, let's continue. And afterwards, a Jewish population. Its fortunes varied as it passed from Spanish to Dutch and from Dutch to English hands. Strange it is to see that the traditions in regard to the treatment of the Jews, which had been imported by the Latin settlers and authorities, so they're telling you, like I said, we were brought in by the Latin, Latin settlers, i.e. Rome, and their authorities, have persisted down into the time of the English rulers. All right? So, and these English rulers, technically one English rulers was British. All right, let's continue. One of the very first to travel extensively in the island was a Jew, Benjamin de Mosquita, a son of David Bueno de Mos Mosquita, the resident of the Elector of Brandenburg and general agent of the Duke of Brunswick, Lunenburg. You hear this? Who went there in 1661. Though he possessed letters of denization, they were of no use to him. Together with some other Jews from the island of Barbados, living at Jamaica, he was banished. The little band took up the residence in New York, where Mosquita died in 1683. Other Jews came to Jamaica from Holland in 1668. In 1671, Abraham Espinosa, of uh, the family of the famous Benedict Spinoza, as also Jacob de Torres from London, they came, pay attention, possessed of all the rights of English citizens, but they were traders and shopkeepers and aroused the hatred of their rivals. In 1671, the English traders protested the petition to have the activity of the Jews confined to wholesale commerce. It is true, the governor was posed to this growing animosity, but he was quite powerless. As the community grew apace with the arrival from Holland of more of their brethren, a rabbi was appointed and in 1683 was brought to his office from the island of Coraco. All right, so before I continue, at this time, we are already in, in, in bondage, servitude, all right? So whenever you hear them saying English traders and all this, this is all British people. And um and I have to I'm glad I can, can clear that confusion up because you know when I first got this I would have probably been thinking like said oh yeah they speak about English but this is the reason why you have to have a a, a good broad understanding of history and and knowing who's the ball players and who came in and, and who were actually truly supposed to be there and who weren't all right so let me go ahead and continue the people of the island it is quite evident made up the hostile um, element all right. The extraordinary levies to which the Jews were subject were passed into law by the popular assembly and a report of the governor to the home authorities dealing with the matter makes the ordinary charges, which one has been accustomed to, to read in Berlin, Kruzstunk, the Paris Liber uh, uh or in the manifestos of a former Vienna uh, Burgesmeister. Uh, it says the gravamen complained of by the Jews of Jamaica was that their nation and the island did not exceed in number 80 persons, including married men, bachelors, widows, and the poor maintained on charity. They had been in, um, inordinately taxed after the French had been repulsed in 1693. The Jews had to pay blah, 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 blah what we'll, we'll say, they paying money, they're getting taxed. All right, so let's get to the good point. The Jews had an additional complaint. They had been forced to bear arms on the Sabbath day which was contrary to their religious principles unless in case of a necessity where an enemy is in sight or apprehension of being near. All right. It was a Baron de Beaumont. Pay attention. It was a Baron de Beaumont who became the spokesman of the Jews and who in the first instance presented the position of the Jews to his majesty, the King of England. Now pay attention to this because like you said, if Baron de Beaumont, this is a, if he's a spokesman of the Jews, that means that he's one in the same with, with them. We already told you that the Moranos and the Jews, these were Berbers. And they all had the same complexion or persuasion. So these are all dark, melanated people. All right. And now it says that he had to present a petition of the Jews to his majesty, the King of England, which let you know that Baron de Belmont, his allegiance is to the King of England. So... As you see, Belmont, Belmont, Beaumont, Belmont, my family, our allegiance is to England. Not only that, but we also consider Jews or Moranos, as well as Anglo-Saxons. 
You see this? Pay attention because you're not going to get this true this understanding anywhere because with these three identifications, they're all one and the same because they all go back to who? Berbers. All Berbers. Let's continue. This petition was referred by the King's Privy Council in England to the governor of the island, Sir William Beeston, who in his own name and that of the council made a reply. Okay, so we're not going to read into that part. What I wanted to read was this last point. Okay, so this is going back to all right. So that because we want to know who is this Baron Beaumont, and it's not going to be much information you're going to find online because clearly they're hiding something. But I was able to find this this uh, that petition through the archives of London. So info is there. You just got to go look. All right, so let's free this reading. It says, so what the outcome of the petition is referenced was, we do not know. It seems probable that the council refused to take any action in the matter. The satisfaction continued, and when Antonio Gomez, Serra, Andrew Lopez, and Moses de Medina made a complaint to the king, the Board of Trade of Jamaica was required to forward a copy of Baron de Belmont's memorial and of the reply to it. Our interest in the matter centers in the fact that the case of the Jews was in the hands of a Baron de Belmont. Who was he? His personal name is not given, nor any additional family name that he may have born, that he may have born. We are left dependent entirely upon conjecture. One's first thought is to connect him with the Amsterdam's family whose ramifications have been studied in previous chapters. It must not be forgotten that most of the members of the Jewish community in Jamaica have come either directly or indirectly from Holland, as the matter referred to took place in the year 1700. It is quite within the range of possibility that this Baron de Belmont was the son of Baron Manuel de Belmont de, the Spanish resident in the Dutch capital. It is also worth noting that at the date of member of the family no longer living in Latin surroundings, had, pay attention to this, because many people wanted to know, like say, well, what happens to a lot of the letters in our, our name? It says, it is also worth noting that at that date, a member of the family no longer living in Latin surroundings had, in a sense, modernized the family name by dropping the final E. So like, for instance, Belmont, I was born with, but that's because the family dropped the T. All right. So, and wherever we went, or they, they did probably said it Belmont, but whoever heard it probably just didn't put the T on there. So remember, cause it's a lot easier for people, less letters. And that's what folks were doing. They're removing letters, but same people. All right. So it says, this is, of course, another possibility, though. I have no grounds for preferring it. This, that, exactly at this time, they, they don't want to prefer it, but remember who's writing. This, that this Baron de Beaumont had come from England. Of course, because Beaumont is an English surname. It goes to England and France. All right. So reread that. So, like I said, this Baron de Beaumont had came from England. To Jamaica, <laughs> and he was Jew. So these people are are dark people, man. It's, it's me, my family. All right, we know that a branch of the Belmont family has settled in London, where even to this day there are members of the Sephardic congregation of that of that name. The search in London is, however, rendered singularly difficult owing to the fact that it was the custom then as now for foreigners to make use of the greater security offered by English institutions and to keep their monies as well as to register their wills there just there, excuse me. Just as so many crowned heads to this day keep their valuables deposited in the Bank of England, so did the rich continental Moranos and Jews in the 17th and 18th centuries. All right, so, and that's where I'm going to stop at because we just came to the conclusion who the Belmonts were coming not only from so-called England at that time, but trans traversing to uh, to Jamaica and then providing uh, facts that everywhere we went, we found friends and family and they all looked just like us. 
These people were called Maranos and Jews and even Anglo-Saxons. Why? Because they all are one and the same. These are all the same people, just different customs, came in during different times and, and having different values, but same bloodline. And they all trace themselves back to the same house. So how do I know? Well, let's go before I end this. It's the reason why pedigrees are so important. And there's only really one pedigree I really want to show you. All right. All right, so this is the pedigree of the lineage coming from one of the sides. Now, we all know John Gaunt comes from the House of Lancaster. The House of Lancaster has been a cadet branch of the House of Plantagenet. All right. And John Gaunt's wife, the Beaufort line. Now, this is not the Beaufort line. We're Belmonts. But John Gaunt have a daughter who married the king of Portugal. So, this is how the Plantagenet blood came over here into Portugal. And Edegon, which we can call Spain today. So you got Portugal, Edegon, Castile, all are getting Plantagenet blood via John Gaunt, daughter, Philippa. All right. So that's all I wanted to show you. You know, do your research in your family. You never know what you're going to find. But those who come at home, enjoy this work. Do it because time is of the essence. So that being said, I love you, and I'm looking forward to see you all come home who's ready to come home. When you're called, few are chosen. So with that being said, peace.